The first steam engine to run on rails was built by Richard Trevithick in 1804. The oldest surviving locomotive is William Headley's Wylam Colliery engine, built just eight years later. Aginoria is also typical of the early coal hauling railways. She was built by Foster Rastrick and Company of Stourbridge to work the Earl of Dudley's shut end colliery. But George Stevenson is remembered as the man who really developed the steam locomotive. After early experiments in the coal fields of the Northeast, his rocket won the 1829 Rainhill Trials. Key innovations such as the fire tube boiler, direct drive, and chimney blast pipe became permanent features of the steam locomotives which followed. By the 1840s, the National Railway Network was taking shape and engine design had become much more refined. But innovation and variety were still very much the order of the day. Copper knob had bar frames and a haystack firebox. In contrast, the London and Northwestern's Cornwall had massive central driving wheels of eight and a half feet in diameter. By the 1870s, the British railway network was almost complete and a handful of large companies were in a position to dominate and even bully the multitude of smaller railways. The larger companies built their own locomotives and the locomotive superintendent or chief mechanical engineer became the driving force in locomotive design. Here we see surviving examples from more than a dozen pre-grouping railways. The work of locomotive designers who were to be worshipped by generations of British schoolboys. Names such as William Stroudley, Dougal Drummond, Webb, Wainwright, Churchwood and Sir Henry Fowler live on in the locomotives they left behind.
This mid-Victorian steam navvy is just one example of the many engines which worked beyond the confines of the public railways.
thousands of locomotives were built for private use at collieries, steelworks, and other industrial premises. They were even employed in the construction of new railways. Most of these locomotives were tank engines, and dozens of manufacturers produced variations on the basic functional design. There were also some more unusual designs of the industrial locomotive. Fireless varieties, which could operate remotely from their source of steam, while others had geared drives or vertical boilers.
many industrial concerns, such as the slate quarries of North Wales, were in mountainous areas. The solution to the cost of building railways through such terrain was to narrow the gauge. The reduced capital expenditure also appealed to a few other isolated railways, and narrow gauge lines became fairly widespread. Since the end of the 19th century, many narrow-gauge railways have been built specifically for the sightseer, providing excursions to holiday destinations and popular beauty spots.
Snowdon's Mountain Railway has been in business since 1895, while many other lines, which began as industrial narrow gauge, have since been transformed to convey visitors and tourists. The wartime success of the Centralised Railway Executive Committee led to the railway amalgamation of 1923. This created four large companies and the interwar period which followed 
is considered by many to have been the golden age of the steam locomotive. The motive power of the Southern Railway was largely the creation of its two great designers, Richard Maunsell and Oliver Bullitt. Here are a number of Maunsell's locomotives, including his popular Arthur and Nelson classes, as well as two fine examples of Bullitt's wartime Pacifics.
the Great Western Railway was renowned for its manors, halls, kings and castles, as well as its mighty tank engines and traditional saddle tanks. Charles B. Collett, chief mechanical engineer between 1921 and 1941, had a hand in the design of them all. Sir Henry Fowler continued with the London, Midland and Scottish, LMS for short, after working for the Midland Railway. The Jinty, a product of the Vulcan foundry, is one of his designs for the LMS. Sir William Stanier took over as chief mechanical engineer in 1932. He immediately set about the task of producing large mainline passenger engines and fast mixed traffic locomotives for the LMS. His Black Fives mixed traffic locomotives were widely considered to have been the most efficient this country has ever seen.
The main priority for the London and North Eastern Railway was the provision of fast and comfortable services along its East Coast main line. Sir Nigel Dresley Pacific solved this problem and provided us with some of the fastest and best luck of all British steam locomotives. Certain classes of engine were built specifically for the Ministry of Supply for wartime needs. Designed by R.A. Riddles, the 210 and 280 austerities were simple but functioned well and were put to work all over Britain as well as abroad. The Hunslet Engine Company also designed a standard shunting engine for the War Department. These 060 tanks were also known as austerities and were turned out in large numbers by various manufacturers. After the war, a number of these engines passed over to British Rail. With the Great War over, heavy industry continued at the core of British manufacturing and its transport requirements were met in large part by extensive networks of private industrial railways. During this period, a number of locomotive manufacturers such as Barclay, Hunslet, Kitson and Bagnall began to dominate the industry. Thank <laughs> you. 
Between the wars, the demands on a narrow-gauge locomotives were amazingly varied. The Great Western Railway ran narrow-gauge freight and passenger services on the Vale of Rydal, a unique railway which provided VR with its last steam services and still survives under private ownership. The Romney Hyde and Dimchurch Railway was built in 1926 as a third size miniature main line. Many of its exquisite main line locomotives were built by David Paxman, and today they form the finest 15 inch gauge collection in the country. Other locomotives were built for industrial railways. But narrow-gauge industrial lines were already in decline, along with the traditional industries which they served. One British locomotive type which has not survived in its standard gauge form is the Garrett. This three foot six inch gauge monster was built in Manchester by Bayer Peacock and spent its working life in South Africa. Charkas Kral also spent her working life in South Africa being a rare wartime export from Leeds. Following nationalisation in 1948, many successful locomotive designs, such as the LMS Ivert Moguls and the Great Western Railway's Manors, continued in production and performed well under British Rail livery for many more years.
BR's locomotive superintendent, R.A. Riddles, evolved a plan for large-scale production of 12 standard designs of steam locomotive over the following decade. The first was Britannia, but other typical designs were the Class 4M T460s and the 264 tanks, both simple and reliable mixed traffic locomotives. In 1954, the Class 9 appeared, the last of the BR standard designs. Two years later, British Rail decided to abandon steam propulsion altogether, and although production continued until 1960, the undue haste of the dieselization program meant that these magnificent engines had a regrettably short and uneconomic lifespan. After the war, Unusual industrial engines such as the vertical boilers, St. Monans, continued in production. British steam served private industry for a decade longer than British rail, but the new diesel engines were easier to operate and were rapidly taking over. popular austerity saddle tanks continued in production until 1953. Many were sold to collieries and other industrial concerns and they have since found their way onto dozens of preserved railways. Their simple and robust construction makes for economic running and they are ideally suited to work on these short private steam lines. Today, steam is the sole preserve of enthusiasts, day trippers, and holiday makers. So far, production of standard gauge locomotives 
has been beyond the purse of preservation societies, but a number of new narrow-gauge locomotives have been produced. Here are splendid examples on the Ravenglass in Eskdale, the Fairborn and the Festinog railways. We had this dream of building the ultimate locomotive, one which wouldn't break down, uh, one which would keep on running, would be economical and easy to maintain. I'm rather proud to say that from the minute we put a fire into her, she's never failed since. She's never been off the road, and uh, so far she's exceeded every expectation we could have possibly asked of her. She's certainly the most powerful minimum gauge engine ever built in the world. <laughs> 